Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. It's so nice to have you here today. Welcome, I'm Janice Kamener Resnick and I welcome you on behalf of the members of our leadership team, which includes former Congressman Mel Levine and former LA County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky. Thank you and welcome to tonight's special guest, Giddy Greenstein. And of course, thanks and welcome to our wonderful moderator, my friend and my rabbi, Edward Feinstein. This Wednesday, we welcome the Bulwark's amazing Sarah Longwell and her Democratic counterpart, Simon Rosenberg. Simon, if you'll remember, is the only pollster or analyst who correctly predicted that there would be no red wave in 2022. They will be in conversation with Larry Mantle. It'll be a great conversation. Next week, we have two programs again, both on Monday and on Wednesday. On Monday will likely be our last Israel in crisis program until after the presidential elections. So join us to hear two Washington Institute fellows, Dana Stroll and Michael Singh. Uh, Singh. The, Dana was uh, served under President Biden as the highest, the Pentagon's top civilian official with responsibility for the Middle East. And Michael Singh, uh, Singh was Singh, senior director for Middle East affairs under President George W. Bush. Uh, so it should be a great program. Then on Wednesday next week, we have Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent with the New York Times, and Susan Glasser of the New Yorker, always two brilliant analysts, will be sharing their views about the upcoming election. Now to introduce and engage our, our guest tonight, please welcome my colleague, friend, and partner in this America at a Crossroads Enterprise, fellow UCLA Bruin, former LA County Supervisor, Zev Yaroslavsky. Zev? Thank you very much, Janice, uh, and good evening uh, and good morning, uh, wherever you may be, uh, to all of you. It's my privilege to introduce Giddy Grinstein, uh, who was the youngest member of the Israel delegation to the Camp David Summit uh, uh, meetings at, uh, in uh, 2000, uh, and who engaged in direct negotiations with the PLO as part of the Oslo Accords. Uh, he is the author of his new book, uh, Insights, Peacemaking in the Oslo Process, 30 Years and Counting. Uh, it's a timely book and a, and a timely subject. Uh, Giddy has spent his life uh, committed to the pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace and fighting for the two-state solution. Uh, the book he wrote has been praised by none other than Dennis Ross, who called the book the single best book on understanding the issues and approaches of the different players. Uh, its insights are essential for any future attempt to bring Israel-Palestine uh, peace. Uh, Giddy is the founder and president of an innovative organization in Israel called Reut, which engages in developing uh, creative future leadership for Israeli civil society to tackle Israel's most critical challenges. His interlocutor tonight will be Rabbi Ed Feinstein. Uh, Ed is, uh, has spent 30 years uh, leading one of Los Angeles' preeminent conservative uh, congregations, uh, San Fernando Valley Beth Shalom. He is on the faculty of the Ziegler Rabbinical School and the Wexner Heritage Foundation. He's a distinguished author in his own right uh, and a good friend uh, to many of us and a mentor to, uh, to some of us. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, uh, Rabbi. It's all yours. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. And Giddy, thank you so much for taking some time to share with us. Your insights have always been so, so very valuable to those of us trying to understand Israel, its place in the Middle East, and the future of the Jewish people. So let, let's begin with what is very obvious to us all. We're coming upon the yard site of October 7th, the yearly anniversary of October 7th. There are still hostages being held by Hamas. There are still soldiers in the field. What's the feeling in Israel as we come upon this year yearly anniversary? How do people, what are people thinking about? What are they talking about? And how are they feeling? Um. I think that, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Janice, Zev, uh, you, Rabbi Feinstein, for hosting me tonight. It's really a great pleasure to be here with this tremendous audience. I'm seeing already more than 1,200 people on this call. Um, so it's an honor and a pleasure to, to be here with you tonight. I think um, that all of you know that this, um, that the uh, attitude in Israel and the sentiment in Israel is very mixed today. A lot of people did not expect this crisis to go that long for the IDF to take, uh, to require so many resources and such a long time in order to achieve a decisive victory in Gaza as well as in the other fronts. And of course, nobody expected that um, close to 197 Israelis would still be held captive in Gaza uh, after the nearly one year after being abducted 
on October 7th. So all of these sentiments are out there, sentiments of, um, I would say, uh, concern about the future, sentiments about insecurity um, and about uh, uncertainty. At the same time, I feel that a lot of people are, are um, equally kind of uh, uh, concerned by the lack of vision by the government in terms of how to finish the war, how to end the war successfully uh, with regards to the, uh, to the Palestinians, both in Gaza as well as in Lebanon. So uh, all these concerns are kind of mixing together and, uh, and all together, I don't think that we're moving into the holidays with, uh, uh, with a good sentiment about uh, the immediate future of the country. So let's probe this a bit. Uh, every Saturday night, there are demonstrations in all the streets of all the great cities of Israel. Half a million people or more are demonstrating in Tel Aviv and, and, and as many around the rest of the country. And they're asking for a deal for a, a, a peace agreement of some sort, a truce agreement that would bring hostages back. What's your assessment of that? Is there any possibility for a deal or has the prime minister blocked it and won't allow it to happen? I think that right now it doesn't look like there'll be a deal anytime soon. Uh, there is no mutual exhaustion, not on Hamas, not on the Israeli side. So therefore there's no ripeness for a deal. Um, I believe that the prime minister is uh, has been adamant on a number of positions that make a deal unlikely. Most recently, the the control, Israel's basically indefinite control of the uh, Philadelphia corridor, which is the corridor between Gaza and Egypt. That is a position that makes it uh, almost impossible for Hamas to make a deal with Israel right now. So uh, I think that we are uh, in a limbo for the time being. And I, uh, I hope that we'll, we'll, we'll get out of it as soon as possible. But right now, I think we're stuck. So you, in your career as a diplomat, you, you came, you spent a great deal of time with Israeli prime ministers. So help us understand this prime minister. Help us understand what, what is he thinking tonight? Where's his head tonight? When he looks at this circumstance, when he sees those demonstrations, when he feels the pressure from America, what is this man thinking? Well, it's very hard to say uh, at the moment, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a shrink. I do think that it's kind of evident that this prime minister, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, at the moment, in a moment of an extreme national security challenge, seems to be driven by very powerful political considerations. And that is something that people are very concerned with. Meaning even now, at the, at the verge of a potential expansion of our crisis into Lebanon, uh, the prime minister is dealing with a major political reshuffle of the government, which is driven by the need to uh, accommodate some factions of his, uh, of his coalition, primarily the ultra-Orthodox. He wants to bring in, he wants to shift the minister of defense, bring in an alternative minister of defense that could help make it easier for him to pass uh, a deal that would sustain his coalition. So uh, ultimately, I think that it is hard to say that in this moment, again, a moment of outstanding, unprecedented uh, uh, national security crisis, people are looking at a prime minister and seeing one is actually driven by the overall well-being of uh, the society and the ability to win the war. So, so let's expand on that just a moment. Again, because you have wonderful insights. What happens when a population can't trust its government in the middle of a war? What's the social consequence of the unraveling of, co of collective trust when you're going into a war and there's another war threatening that's going to be even more dangerous than the first one? I'll tell you what I hope the consequence will be. I hope that the consequence will be a vote of support for a centrally centrist driven coalition. I think we have had an experiment of what we used, we call in Israel Yemin al Maleh, an all right, uh, all right wing party. This is an experiment that is, has led to one disaster after another. December 2022, uh, the Economist ranked Israel as the fourth strongest economy in the world. We are like a generation away from that observation. Uh, this government came in, its initial statement was that it wants to expand sovereignty of Israel over the West Bank, 
that uh, and that the Jewish people are the only indigenous people in the land. Um, moving forward, we saw a an attempt to do a constitutional reform that had little to do or nothing to do with the long-term well-being and security of the country. This is when the prime minister himself said that the number one challenge of Israel is Iran. So on the one hand, consistently saying that Iran is our biggest challenge, and at the same time, taking on projects that are massively disrupting. Uh, at the same time, and not fully correlated, I have to say, not fully correlated, Hamas was preparing for war. By April 2023, meaning six months before the war began, Hamas was ready to pull the trigger. And they were sitting on their, basically on their guns for six months. Meanwhile, there was constant escalation in the West Bank. There was at the same time an attempt to arrive at a breakthrough with Saudi Arabia and the United States, what is called the Saudi deal, that would have been another major disruption to regional uh, equilibrium of power, meaning sidelining Iran. This would, would have been a move that really would have re really marginalized Iran. And all these things were kind of a, in a pressure cooker. They were all converging around the summer of 2023. And while all of this was, was happening, we had a government that was distracting everybody with some sort of an internal constitutional experiment that no one could guarantee would have worked. And eventually it actually clearly failed. So we're seeing that this kind of far right, uh, out of center government has brought bad news to Israel. And I really hope that the response, the political response to that would be that people would vote for centrist government, center right, center left. It doesn't really matter as long as it's a pragmatic government that is leading with a legitimate coalition from the center. We have to remember that all great countries, while they're great, their common denominator is that they are pragmatically led from the center. And uh, when we have dogmatic governments throughout history, this really spells a uh, big problem, as we're seeing in Israel. So I hope that the political lesson will be, as the polls are indicating, that the next government will be a totally different government. Yeah, but you need an election. And yes. to get an election, the coalition has to dissolve. And right now, with all the instability, no one from the coalition has abandoned him yet. You're right, but we have to remember this, okay? Israel is a parliamentary government. Parliamentary government, parliamentary uh, uh, structure, a parliamentary, a parliamentary political system. That means that on average, these parliaments serve about three years, a little bit more than three years. This is kind of general average across 10 years. Uh, uh, first year, year and a half, two years are relatively stable, again, throughout history. Uh, throughout our history, throughout the history of other parliamentary systems. And and the primary reason for that is that there is a, a, a very high turnover among members of the parliament, which means if the parliament votes itself out of office, a third, it used to be that a third of the members of the parliament are not coming back. Today, it's closer to half. So half of them, when they vote themselves out of office, they're also voting themselves out of their job. And this is the major coalescing power that keeps them together. But as we get edge closer and closer to the two-year milestone, and then two and a half years and three years, the government begins to disintegrate, and people are beginning to make calculations about the next election. Um, so uh, I think that right now, in spite of the tremendous difficulties that we are facing, this is still within the expected norm. We are heading toward a budget. Uh, decision. I am not sure that the government is, you know, it's it's questionable whether the government will be able, uh, the, the ruling coalition will be able to pass the budget. But after that, there'll be many other and more and more curveballs and eventually the government will fall. The pressures are really immense. Uh, I also want to point out that, uh, that, uh, that in some ways, because this government represents such a radical political experiment, this all, you know, very right-wing party, in some ways, the longer they're in power, I believe the stronger the backlash will be toward the centrist government uh, and, uh, and voting, changing even historical voting patterns of people who used to be vote right-wing party, or most more likely to vote for center-right parties. And this is a huge difference because in Israel's history, center-right parties 
always built coalitions with center-left parties and vice versa. It is only in recent years that we're seeing the center, the central party on the right wing, which is Likud, unable or unwilling to build a coalition with parties to its left. Therefore, Likud today, which is important to note, is the most moderate party within the coalition. It used to be that Likud, when it led the government, it was the central element in the coalition. There were parties to its left and parties to its right. Today, Likud is the most moderate faction in the, in the, in the coalition. This is an unhealthy situation uh, for any ruling party. And Likud, I believe, is going to pay a very, very heavy price for this kind of, of governance that they have been performing. And in some ways, and it's really kind of sad, um, I don't think, for example, I don't think that they have an exit strategy for the war in the North. I don't think they have a vision for victory in the North. And if they do, they haven't communicated it to the public. Unfortunately, I think we're going to go into Lebanon and a year from now, we're still going to be able to declare victory in the same way they were unable to declare victory in Gaza. So more and more people will understand that this kind of dogmatic leadership is leading the country from one challenge to another and eventually will veer to the center. And again, I think that uh, uh, anything that gravitates, the gravitation of the political system toward the center is healthy for Israel and it's healthy for the Jewish people around the world as well. And we'll come back to that. Not at the risk of depressing everyone, I, I want to probe two points that you mentioned. First of all, let's talk about the North, right? Hezbollah has managed to uh, almost evacuate the North of Israel with a very small expenditure of its of its of its resources. Um, how, how come Nisrallah hasn't let it loose? And what would Israel do if that happened? What, what do you think is going to happen in the North? So we know that every war every military campaign needs to lead to some sort of a diplomatic achievement and a political achievement, meaning the use of force needs to be guided by some sort of a vision of the end game. In this case, for example, if I, uh, you know, if I had the magic wand, my goal would be to consolidate and finalize Israel's border with Lebanon. Today, the border with Lebanon is internationally recognized, but not bilaterally agreed. And there are 14 sections along the border, 14 pieces of the border that are still disputed. If I were the Prime Minister of Israel, my goal of the war would be to consolidate the border to once and for all have an internationally recognized and bilaterally agreed border between Israel and Lebanon, which means that the northern perimeter of the space within which the Jewish people realizes its right of self-determination, that northern perimeter is established forever. That is a political goal for the war that I think is absolutely attainable that has historical consequences for us, okay? We are not hearing anything similar from the government. And therefore, we will move into Lebanon. Let's say we'll take a, a, a stretch of 10 kilometers and we will push Hezbollah. The next day, Hezbollah sends you know, teams of people to engage our soldiers in the front line and the fire rockets and, and drones above our head into Israel. What do we do then? Take another 10 kilometers, to the north and then they do it again they friction they challenge our forces in the front line and they fire uh, rockets above our head into israel what is the next move another 10 kilometers now 30 kilometers into lebanon there is no vision for winning the war and that is very concerning in my view what israel you know when israel goes into uh, a military campaign and i support the need for a military campaign at now, given the fact that Hezbollah is not willing to reach some sort of a political accommodation in the North, it has to be with attainable political goals and diplomatic goals. And, and if we have that, I think we can have success in Lebanon and significant successes. But without that, I think we are heading to additional frustration. All right, so let's, let's pursue frustration for a minute. In addition, or actually under the cover of a war and an evacuation in the North, and the horror of the South. What's going on on the West Bank? W what is the conflict now within the West Bank? And what is the Israeli government? And let's say Ben Gvir, who is the police chief now, what is he thinking ought to happen or is going to happen in the West Bank? Well, Ben Gvir and Smotrich have their, uh, their vision clear. 
and their vision was introduced into the platform of this government, which is to extend sovereignty of Israel to the West Bank uh, without equal rights. They're saying it clearly. Uh, at the same time, they're calling for the dismantling of the Palestinian Authority and some sort of Israel establishing direct military and civil control of the Palestinian population in the West Bank, about 3 million. They have a vision, and at least they're clear about it, and they're transparent about it. The question is, what is the Prime Minister's vision? Because if the Prime Minister subscribes to their vision, then, of course, at some point, the Palestinian Authority will collapse, and we will be drawn into direct control of the Palestinian population in the West Bank. But if the prime minister believes that Israel should separate, be politically separate from the Palestinians, then the Palestinian Authority, which is the self-governing body of the Palestinians in the West Bank, according to the Oslo Accords, is absolutely vital for Israel's long-term vision. Meaning, if in our vision, we are not directly controlling the Palestinians in the West Bank, then someone else needs to do that, and that is the Palestinian Authority. And this is where the policy of the government is really incoherent because if to the extent that Prime Minister Netanyahu you know, is, is believes in his own statements, which is that we do not want to control the Palestinian population in the West Bank, then the, uh, the government is effectively undermining the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And that's the contradiction. We're seeing here contradiction in the goals, which inevitably will lead to the collapse of one of them. And what do we mean by the collapse of one of them? Either the Palestinian Authority implodes and Israel is, is drawn into controlling uh, the, the, uh, the Palestinian population in the West Bank, or that uh, uh, effectively at some point, they uh, the government will have to acknowledge that the Palestinian Authority has to be strengthened and therefore they the government will have to collaborate with the Palestinian Authority in the security efforts against the terrorist activities in the West Bank. And by the way, at that point, the, the contradiction in Gaza will come to the surface because today the government of Israel says, we don't want to directly control Gaza. This is one statement. At the same time, the government is saying no Hamas, no Palestinian Authority and no Fatah. Then who? And we're already seeing the vacuum. We're seeing the IDF moving into Gaza, taking over territories, clearing Hamas forces, and then pulling back, not introducing an alternative body of government to, to fill the vacuum. And then a few months later, we're moving back in. So um, uh, we, we're seeing that uh, at least until now, without a coherent set of goals, um, what I call frustrations will continue. And the frustration is that we are almost a year into the war with Gaza. Hamas is the weakest of our enemies, and we're not able to declare victory. So let's pursue that West Bank idea for a moment. In February, you published an important piece in the Times of Israel called uh, Pal uh, representing a Palestinian state the right way. And you've given some interviews to that extent. And I, I want to pursue that with you. What is, what is the right way? Is there really a call at this moment to establish statehood for Palestinians? And I have to tell you just, Beinenu, that I know a lot of Israeli friends, both scholars and regular folks, and I think you're the only one I know who is actually taking this idea of a Palestinian state very seriously at this point. So talk to us about that belief. Okay, so first of all, I want to relate to what was going on in February, and then we'll speak moving forward about the whole idea of a Palestinian state, etc. Please. What was happening in February is that Israel launched into the war at the end of October. I mean, Hamas attacked October 7th, and then Israel mobilized and organized in October, I think, 26, 27, and we went into Gaza, and there was no exit strategy. There was no statement by the government of what are the political goals of the war, and that was very concerning for the Americans, and we all remember the extended visit of Secretary of State Blinken, obviously Biden, but then also Blinken, who actually, in one of his visits, spent seven hours with the Israeli cabinet trying to understand what are the goals of the war. And what are we? What is Israel trying to achieve beyond these objectives of eliminating the military force of Hamas and the governing capabilities of Hamas and returning the hostages? What then? You know, wh what's the day after? What's the political horizon? And there were no answers. Once there were no answers, the American side, the American government began to explore two alternative approaches. One approach was uh, 
what we now call the Saudi deal, okay? The Saudi deal was that there would be a defense agreement between the US and Saudi and a normalization deal between Saudi and Israel. This was one approach. The other approach was basically to engage in some sort of a political horizon, spelling out in together with Arab countries, meaning with Saudi, with the UAE, with Jordan, with Egypt, with the Palestinians, and the United States to make sort of a detailed presentation of what the political horizon between Israelis and Palestinians would look like. And as part of that, in January and February, there were discussions in Washington about the possibility of recognizing the Palestinian authority as a state, that the United States would recognize the Palestinian authority as a state. Now, I, if you add, if you wish me, Rabbi Feinstein, if you wish, I can go into the details, but my article was my way, after a lot of back channeling and track two, it was my way of communicating to Washington, saying, hey, if you guys are going ahead with recognition of Palestinian authority as a state, there is a way to do it that serves long-term interests of Israel, of the Palestinians, and of America. And I'll give a few examples. For example, by saying that once a Palestinian state is established, the right of return of all Palestinian refugees will be realized in the Palestinian state, meaning no more nonsense about the right of return of Palestinian state into Israel. This is the first example. A second example, if you will go down the path of recognizing the Palestinian Authority as a state, please say that the right of self-determination of all Palestinians are realized in the Palestinian state. This is important not just because there are two million Arab Israelis of Palestinian origin in Israel. There's also four million Jordanians with Palestinian origin. And it is very important for the whole region to know that the entire issue of Palestinian self-determination will have been realized within the Palestinian state. So I was giving all these pointers to say, if someone decides to go down the path of recognizing Palestinian authority as a state, there are very important points to take into consideration. And that was the goal of this article. So honestly, it, uh, it turned out that thousands of people read it. I heard about it from all over the world. But honestly, it was written for 25 people, maybe 15 people <laughs> who are actually the decision makers. And um, the way to communicate with them is not through the Times of Israel, with all due respect to the Times of Israel. It's with a link on WhatsApp or on a text message, you know, which is, and those of you on the, on this audience that will take the time to read the article, you'll see it is, everybody can read it, but it's not, it wasn't written for public consumption. It was written for a very specific group of people that made, made that was on the verge, or was considering making a historical decision. So if Anthony Blinken called you tonight and said, should I do it? Should I declare, should I recognize the statehood of the Palestinian Authority? And should I pressure Israel to recognize it as well? Would you tell him to do it? This is a great question. And here, yes, I'm a kind of a very shining minority. I believe that Israel has an interest in recognizing the Palestinian Authority, in this Palestinian Authority being recognized as a state with all the caveats that I mentioned. And this is the, the advantage of the United States doing it, meaning the United States can actually uh, introduce a Palestinian state the idea of a Palestinian statehood with all the caveats that ensure the long-term national security interest of Israel. That is, if you believe, this is all within the framework that of someone believing that there needs to be political separation between Israelis and Palestinians in the West Bank. If you subscribe to this view, I think that this is the most efficient and the best way for Israel to reach that outcome, much more promising, let's say, than bilateral negotiation. At the same time, um, for example, another statement that is crucially important is to establish that the future permanent borders of that state will be negotiated, meaning that it's not kind of a pre, uh, preconceived, uh, it's not kind of predetermined that the borders of the Palestinian state are the June 4th, 1967 lines. Again, if the United States goes ahead and does an act of recognition, this is another very important point. So we spoke about you know, finalizing and terminating the refugee issue. 
within respect of the refugee issue, a Palestinian state comes into being, UNRWA has to be out. It's illogical to have a Palestinian refugee in a Palestinian state and a UN Relief, Relief and Works Agency within Palestine. Again, the only the United States can do that. It's making a statement that the entire right of, of the Palestinian self-determination is realized in the Palestinian state. Very important for the future of Israel and for the future of Jordan. Only the United States can do that. That the future borders will be based on UN Security Council Resolution 242. This is a position that Israel subscribed for probably 15 times. And, um, and that could happen. That the area of Jerusalem, not necessarily the specific borders, will be the capital of both states. This is consistent with the Trump plan. The, uh, people in your audience that will take the time to read the Trump land, you'll see that even the Trump land suggests that the area of Jerusalem will house both capitals uh, and so on. So there are all these points that could be brought together if the United States leads the charge on the bringing into being of, of a Palestinian state. And I will tell you that if I were the advisor of the Israeli government, again, a government that seeks a political separation from the Palestinians, not this government, I would tell them that their best way for Israel to secure its interest is for the idea of statehood to come from Washington. Hmm. But again, this is kind of, uh, it's not politics and diplomacy 101. We're talking here about very kind of a uh, um, uh, chess game right? Um, um, uh, that are designed to effectively use the power of America to secure long-term interest of Israel. And on one side, the question is, how would you be sure that that Palestinian state did not radicalize and end up as Hamas on the West Bank? And on the other side, if the Palestinian Authority said, we'll accept your offer, but we want all of the Jewish settlers out of the West Bank, how do you solve with those two problems? Okay, so first of all, uh, again, all of these points are in the article. And since we're speaking about, about that, I really urge the audience to take a look at it. Palestinians, they do it right. Let's speak about the first issue of the radicalization. Another point that I think is crucial is to go back to the Oslo Accords that established that only political parties that accept the Oslo Accords can be part of the Palestinian political system. This is written black and white in the Oslo Accords, and it was a decision of the Bush administration in 2000 and late 2005 to forego this principle. And there were a lot of people, Israelis and Palestinians and even Americans, including present company that said to the Americans, it's a dramatic, horrible mistake. The Hamas cannot be allowed to participate in the elections because they're not accepting the Oslo Accords. But Washington was certain that in these elections, uh, the Fatah, uh, which is the Palestinian party that supported the Oslo process, will win in such a decisive way that this will be kind of an historical vindication of the Oslo Accord. So they, they effectively made a huge bet that on the outcome of the elections. And when Hamas won the elections, effectively, I think, to me, this is the beginning, the, really the origin of the crisis that we're in is the Palestinian election in January 2006, in which Hamas participated and should have never been able to allow to participate. What's the lesson for me? If there is an ever a recognition in a Palestinian state, there cannot be participation of parties that reject the idea of Israel in these elections. They cannot even participate in the elections. And then on the other side, what do you do about all the settlers now? And, and what kind of a government would Israel need it was hard enough to take settlers out of Gaza. This is so much bigger problem. Well, I agree with you. We have to remember that according to the Oslo Accords, um, uh, there is, uh, the, the West Bank is divided into three types of area. Area mm -hmm. A, which is fully controlled by the Palestinian Authority, security and civil responsibilities. Area B, which is civil controlled by the Palestinians and military security controlled by Israel. Area A is 18%, Area B is 22%, 60% is Area C, which will be subject to future negotiations. Uh, so um, basically what the Oslo Accords are saying is that all of Area A and all of Area B will be part of the Palestinian entity. The Oslo Accords don't use the words Palestinian state, but uh, that Area C will be subject to future uh, negotiations. All of the settlements that we're talking about are within Area C. Now, is this a simple problem to solve? No, it's extremely complicated. But 
it's also a much smaller problem than we have today. So I believe in graduality. I believe in uh, uh, in kind of consolidating the political process in phases and then moving from one phase to another. I want to remind the audience uh, and the listeners that this is a very important week specifically for this conversation. September 13 is the milestone anniversary for the Oslo Accords. The first Oslo Accord was signed September 13, 1993. September 15 is the milestone anniversary for the Abraham Accords, which were signed September 15, 2000. September 17, tomorrow, is the milestone for the Camp David Accords of 1978. These agreements, symbolically within one week, are all interconnected. The Camp David Accords of 1978 created the framework for peace in the Middle East. They also established the framework, basically the template for the Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords of 1993 followed the, 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 the path that was designated by the Camp David Accords of 1978. And there would not have been an Abram Accords without the Oslo Accords. So we are on kind of a track, a historical process that is 46 years in the making. And some people say, I know Aluf Ben is coming. It's a point uh, that he, he mentions often. It actually goes back to 1974. It actually goes back to the Nixon-Kissinger strategy that of de-escalating the tensions with the Soviet Union in the early 70s. Okay, so there is a long history to the situation that we are in, uh, in right now. And, and what I'm saying is that... that uh, um, that all of this was made possible because President Sadat of Egypt believed in graduality. Again, I, uh, those of you in the audience who want to read more, you should read Kissinger's book on leadership. Kissinger discusses six cases of really seminal leadership, and one of them is Sadat. And he explains there that the Carter administration believed in trying to pursue Israeli Arab peace, a very uh, kind of um, ambitious diplomatic uh, initiative. But Sadat, president of Egypt, he wanted a bilateral attainable achievement with Israel. And this is why President Sadat comes to Israel in November 1977, to circumvent the Carter administration attempt to do, to have an all or nothing approach. That I think is the wisdom of politicians, of doing what is possible when is possible. One last comment in this respect, the Oslo Accords, initially started in a very kind of phased approach, okay? The 1993-1995 Oslo Accords represent um, kind of, a, these are the agreements of what is then possible between the parties and all of the difficult issues are being left for the future. But for the later phase of the Oslo Accord, it became, it was, took the approach of really trying to reach an agreement that is an incredibly complicated agreement because permanent status agreement, the peace treaty between Israel and the Palestinians was supposed to do three giant things. Number one, to resolve the outstanding issues since 1948. The second thing is to bring into being a Palestinian state in agreement in its permanent borders with all its powers and capabilities. And third is to kind of, to establish the future relations between that Palestinian state in Israel. All of these things had to be in one agreement. I was the secretary of the delegation that negotiated this. My responsibility was to manage the text of this agreement, which is called the Framework Agreement on Permanent Status. So you can take it from me. It's an extremely complicated piece of diplomatic work uh, that required tremendous sophistication by the negotiators. Um, uh, so um, what I want to say is that in 2003, President Bush and the Quartet which is, refers to the uh, EU, Russia, the, uh, the United States, and the U UN, I believe, they put forward an idea called the Roadmap. The Roadmap for Peace called for establishing a Palestinian state in provisional borders with provisional capabilities. And only then, once this state is established, this state would negotiate with Israel on a state-to-state -state basis would create and shape permanent status. So this was a phased approach that was much more realistic in terms of its objectives. And since it was introduced in 2003, I have been a big proponent of the roadmap, the architecture of the roadmap over the architecture of Oslo. Again, the architecture of Oslo says, first, the comprehensive agreement 
resolving outstanding issues, bringing a state into being, uh, uh, solving in one swoop all of the future relations with Israel and that Palestinian state, and then a Palestinian state comes into being. So Oslo says, first an agreement, then a state. The roadmap said, first a state in provisional borders and powers, and only then permanent status. Okay, so I think that the roadmap is the much more realistic approach than Oslo. So if you ask me, how do you move forward? I say roadmap over Oslo. And because I believe roadmap over Oslo, I also believe in bringing into being a Palestinian state in provisional powers and responsibilities as a platform for shaping long-term relations with Israelis and Palestinians. The one last point to, important to remember here is that right now, Israel is in a unique situation because we control the entire security perimeter of the Palestinian side. This hasn't been the case since 2005. It is the case since the beginning of the war uh, in October 7. So uh, I think that for a variety of reasons right now, there is this really uh, moment where if it happens, it could bring a significant benefits to Israel. Of course, there are risks as well, but there are also extreme risks in the existing environment. So. Uh, Aaron Miller said in the, the interview last week, national security is about choices. It's not about, you know, perfect is not on the menu. Thank you. That was that was a wonderful summary of the whole picture. And I so appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, those who are listening, I, you have to go back and listen to that again, because you just got a whole year's course on Middle Eastern diplomacy and Israeli peace. And I want to thank, by the way, I want to thank all the listeners for um, for the questions that you've sent. We're going to try to include some of them in our conversation going forward. I do appreciate them. Um, I want to just take a moment, let you breathe a moment. Uh, you have a new book out, the book Insights, which discusses your experience as a participant, as secretary, and as the youngest participant in those diplomatic processes, your witnessing of those processes. You know, as the song goes, you were in the room where it happened. And I have to recommend to to those who are watching and listening that that book, um, oftentimes books of diplomatic history can be rather soporific. This one's remarkable because you have such insights about the human beings involved, that this was a process, after all, among very passionate, very capable um, and very visionary human beings. And your insights are very, very valuable. So let me ask you about that specifically, and we may reiterate some of the things you just mentioned because it was so very important. There are members, there are people in the world today, in Israel and in America and elsewhere, both on the left and on the right, who when you mention Oslo or Camp David, they roll their eyes and they say, this was a terrible, terrible mistake. This whole thing was a terrible mistake. Um, they don't want peace or we don't want peace or we'll never have peace. The book tries to correct that. Take a moment and tell us why Oslo was not a mistake. So first of all, I have to say that this book was co-authored with my good friend and uh, and partner in writing, Professor Ali Arona Filalo, is a professor of law at Rutgers University and extremely um, a powerful partner for distilling the ideas of the book that uh, Rabbi Feinstein, you related to. Um, but the book was written balancing two perspectives. First, it was written from a Zionist and Israeli and Jewish perspective, which is Ari and I. Ari is the president of an Orthodox synagogue in New York City, and I'm an Israeli. We brought forward our perspective. At the same time, one of the most important endorsements and praise for the book comes from my counterpart on the Palestinian side, who wrote, this is a fair representation of the Palestinian perspective, meaning we try to share the perspective of the Palestinians who were negotiating with us. And this is a group, if you want to speak about the tragedy of the process, think about this group, the group of moderate Palestinians who believed in peace with Israel. These people were looking at an offer that gave them almost 99% of the West Bank and Gaza, a state, a capital in Jerusalem, $40 billion to resolve the refugee issue and so many other things. This was all on the table. And then everything exploded 20 years later, a catastrophe on their people. And sadly, I believe that Ari and I are the only case in which the story of this group was told and how far they were willing to go, including within their own community, to promote the vision of 
a peaceful resolution of the conflict with Israel. Now, going into this perspective, and by the way, if you go to the website of the book, you will see that you can download the PDF version of the book. My publisher wanted to kill me, but I said to him that for me, it's a matter of principle that Arabs, people in the Arab world, will be able to read this story. Because you here in America, you order the book, a day later it shows up with Amazon. But in Jordan, in the Palestinian areas, around the Arab world, they don't have access not to this lo logistical system and definitely not for, to a book that was written by an Israeli. And that's why my book is available as a PDF for download because I, was, I wanted people in all these places to be able to have access to our story, story of our people, the story of the Zionist movement, which brings me to the, the, the leading, the driving logic of Oslo. You, we are, uh, as of the late 19th century, 1880s, 1890s, the 1900s, okay, 100 years ago, 140 years ago, there is a competition between two national movements for the political uh, uh, self-determination, for the political independence within the area that was originally Ottoman Palestine and then became mandatory Palestine controlled by the British. One movement was extremely successful. And the other one failed. Our movement was successful, although in 1948, there were there was two Arabs for every one Jew in mandatory Palestine. Still, we succeeded. And why? Because we were pragmatic. And beginning in 1936, the Zionist movement accepts the notion that there are two indigenous people in mandatory Palestine. And those two indigenous people each deserves their own political entity. This is the origin of the two-state solution from 1936. And since then, the Zionist movement has been going from strength to strength, 1936, 1947, accepting and agreeing to the UN General Assembly Resolution 181, which is called the partition decision. It calls for a Jewish state and Arab state that led to the establishment of the state of Israel. 1949, the armistice line. And then in 19 Six, after 1967, in October 1967, comes UN Security Council Resolution 242 that acknowledges in eternity the victory of Israel in 1948. Because without getting into too many details, UN Security Council Resolution 242 says that all future negotiations will be only on the West Bank and Gaza, not on Israel proper. So there you go again, another major milestone. We agreed, they rejected. And so the stories go, which means that uh, the Zionist movement, because it was pragmatic, because it understood that there are two indigenous people and we have to divide the land, that pragmatism brought to us diplomatic recognition, economic relations, political influence, and so on. Uh, I've already said and mentioned what happened with this government that actually turned its back on this historical principle, no longer agreeing to the notion that there is an Arab indigenous people in the land, that there needs to be some sort of a political separation. And look at how much trouble we've had in the last uh, year and a half. I'm talking since December 2022, when the current government was established, meaning there is a gravitational aspect in the, our relations with the Palestinians. That is, there are 7 million Jews who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. There are 7 million non-Jews who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. Our 7 million Jews cannot control 5 million non-Jews, 7 million non-Jews, and get away with keeping our state of Israel with a flag that resembles the Talit, with the menorah as our national symbol, with Hebrew as our language, with Jewish holidays as national holidays. All of that could be in jeopardy if we don't separate from the Palestinians. And therefore, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, I believe that upholding the principle of two states for two people is 100% consistent with the Zionist movement and the ultimate goal of establishing a Jewish state, I'm sorry, a space where the Jews have the right to self-determination. That is the state of Israel, a state that has bilaterally agreed borders with all of its neighbors, internationally recognized borders, 
where the Jews can realize the right of self-determination. The Oslo process was 100% consist consistent with this goal. And this is why 30 years later, there are many, many detractors to Oslo, but Oslo has not been canceled. The Palestinian Authority, which is the creation of Oslo, is still around. The Paris Protocol, which is the re regulate the, the economic relations of Oslo, is still in force, largely in force. Security arrangements that were created by Oslo are still in, in effect. And the last thing I'll say, um, I'm putting this forward right now, everybody will see. The most likely political diplomatic outcome of the war in Gaza is the re-extension of the Oslo Accords to Gaza. Okay, after the war, when everything subsides, there will be many attempts to negotiate some sort of a mandate for international force, and all of them will fail, and I can explain why. And then people will turn to the Oslo Accords and say, you know what, we have this body of agreements. Why not just reapply it to Gaza? And this is what will happen. I don't know if it will happen in a month, a year, or five years, but you heard it here from me, it will happen. And what will happen in Gaza then? What's the long term? Will will it end up as an extension of the Palestinian Authority, which yes. will then earn inevitably. statehood? Inevitably, yeah. absolutely inevitably. You, we have to understand everything, all the statements that you're hearing from the government that some sort of an Arab international force will come into Gaza without the invitation of the Palestinian Authority and the PLO is absolute BS. It has zero foundation in reality. I haven't met a single, and I've spoken to many, prominent Arab leader or advisor that subscribes to that. Not even one. They can't even mention one person that believes in that. All of these Arab countries are saying, you want us to come and be a part of the re reconstruction of Gaza? We're willing to do it. We're willing to put in billions of dollars. But it has to be at the invitation of the Palestinian Authority or the PLO. Otherwise, we will be seen as occupiers of Gaza. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing they're saying, we're not coming in as an interim arrangement that is in effect a permanent arrangement because Israel is not willing to speak about the political horizon where the Palestinians are self-governing. So they're repeatedly saying, we will be part of the solution, but we have to be invited by the Palestinian Authority or the PLO, and there has to be a political horizon. Otherwise, you, Israel, they literally said it to me. This is a quote. You broke it, you fix it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, so what I'm saying is the moment people in Israel and the government will begin to understand the implications of direct control of Gaza, then remember national security. Aaron Miller said it four times last week. National security is about choices. Perfect is not on the menu. Okay, so when the alternative will be direct control of Gaza, when one option will be the alternative option, which is let's re-extend Oslo, let's bring an upgraded and reformed Palestinian Authority, upgraded and reformed Palestinian Authority into Gaza and an international force, that option suddenly will become much more attractive. Thank you for that. Thank you for your insight. I, I want to I finish tonight with, with a much different kind of question. Um, I know you, you're living here now, but also spending half of your life in Israel. And living here, I think you'll recognize this circumstance. In a couple of weeks, we're going to gather around tables to welcome the, the, the new year, the Rosh Hashanah. And there are going to be families that sit with their young people, their teenagers and college kids and young adults. And the teenagers and college kids and young adults are going to turn to their parents and say, I don't understand why you're a Zionist. I don't understand your attachment to Israel. Israel appears to me as a militaristic, ethno-nationalist, uh, imperialistic, colonializing state. I don't see why we need to support or protect Israel. And I don't understand why you, mom and dad, Saba and Safta, Mababi and Zayda, why you call yourself Zionists. And so many American parents and grandparents are going to find themselves mute, not knowing what to answer. You've been a Zionist your whole life, not just because you were born there, but because you feel it in your in your in your kishkas. What would you want us to say to our children when they ask us, "Why are you a Zionist?" Well, it really depends what age are the children. Are the uh, children? Imagine also... they're young adults. They're young, yeah, adults, young adults, college okay. and above. 
so basically, uh, as you know, uh, we, um, I also published a book called Flex Digidity. The a very good one stability. too, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, and that book basically um, puts forward and describes the four founding narratives of the Jewish people that we are a nation, meaning we have a specific place on the face of this earth, which is the land of Israel, to which we're attached. This is a story and a narrative about ownership, sovereignty, control, but also exile and return. We're also a people, meaning we're a family and a tribe with a shared destiny and a shared legacy. Uh, we are a religion, meaning collectively and individually, we have a special association with God. Rabbi Feinstein is here. And, and we have a mission to humanity. We are a unique group of people that is commanded to make the world a better place, to be a blessing for the families of the earth. These are four founding stories that are interplaying in our national narrative. You can find all of them in the origin moment of Abraham as the father of our people. He's, he's promised to be a people, a nation. To, he's commanded to be a blessing for the families of the earth. And it's the beginning of the most unique religious association that has shaped all of humanity, of monotheism. All of that there. And then you can find the same narratives in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, in the writing of Herzl, and even in our conversation tonight. So what I will say to these young people is, assuming that they are passionately Jewish, I will say, number one, remember your peoplehood. Even if Israel is in trouble today, there are Israelis there, and they are your extended family. They are your tribe. They are, we have a shared destiny with them. We have a shared legacy with them. We meaning, and I am like on both sides, but it's all of us. And the story of people who transcends political differences, religious differences, geographic differences, the story of people binds people together who have never met. This is why American Jews stood up and cried, let my people go for Russian Jews that they have never met, that dressed differently and ate differently and spoke a different language. This is the logic of people who, the second, thing is yes israel is in crisis nobody who's listened to me in the last hour thinks that i'm a fan of the government but i'm a huge fan of the idea of israel and i believe that we have a right to self-determination including to our own mistakes so what i would urge people is be involved lean in do what you can if you don't like the government support the people work with the people we are in crisis in israel I am involved. I have a nonprofit in Israel that deals with addressing needs of people with disabilities. Since the beginning of the war, we've looking, we've been looking at wounded civilians and soldiers. There's probably 10,000 Israelis that will be recognized as living with disabilities following the war. This is the equivalent of 400, 360,000 Americans. Okay, the scale of the crisis is huge. You have tens of thousands of people are displaced. This is not just about Jewish and Israeli, this is humanitarian, and this is our humanitarian problem within our people. And if all of that doesn't work, I will say the following things. You, I would urge these young people to go to Israel and to see how Israelis are dealing with the crisis that we're dealt with. The innovation in dealing with trauma, the innovation that dealing with all these wounded, injured soldiers, and the, uh, a day will come, this war will be over. And what we have done, we collectively have done in Israel to respond to the crisis of the wounded and the trauma will become the platform for our global leadership and for benefiting millions of people around the world. Last week, as I told you, uh, I'm involved in dealing with the needs of wounded soldiers and civilians in Israel. Last week, I went to Walter Reed, the National Center in Washington, D.C. Believe me, there is so much that we could give America after the, as, as a consequence of the war, as a direct consequence of the war, of what we have learned, we can now bring back to America. So what I would say is peoplehood, rekindle your peoplehood. Don't like the government, that's fine. But the story of Israel is much bigger than one government or another. And the third thing is, of course, we will use the crisis in Israel to bring benefit to many millions of people around the world. And of course, if it's a religious family, then, I mean, that, that, that requires no, no, uh, no explanation. I also want to say, it's not just about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's also about Sukkot. And Sukkot is a holiday where we train the muscle of living frugally. 
of leaving our home, the comfort of our home, and being in a sukkah. And I would urge everyone to think about tens of thousands of Israelis that have spent the last year outside of their home in hotels. We're talking about entire communities, a kibbutz that was an agricultural community with, you know, out there in the south, now living in a building in South Tel Aviv. Even if they have a roof to their head, it's their life has changed dramatically. And talking about people in the north that are in hotels, we're talking about families that have been dislocated, communities that have been dismembered. So Sukkot is the moment when everybody needs to think about the experience of what has been going on in Israel as well. So hopefully one of these arguments will land on an open heart and will move a soul. Idi, thank you so much for your insights and for your passion and for your wisdom. And it's so appreciated at this moment and every moment, but at this moment in our history. And I wish you and your family Shana Tova. Thank you to uh, Janice and Zev and Mel and all the leadership of uh, American at Crossroads for putting on these broadcasts. Um, I listen to them religiously. Uh, they're a very important part of my political education, and I hope that you do too. Next week, uh, September uh, 18th, well, September 18th is tomorrow, actually, the day after tomorrow, Sarah Longwell and Simon Rosenberg interviewed by Larry Mantle, another uh, ob observations about our 2024 elections. The next Israel program with Dana Stroll and Michael Singh on September 23rd. And then through the fall, as we get closer to the election, this wisdom is so very valuable to us all. Thank you for being part of our program tonight. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions, but there's so many wonderful things to talk to Giddy about. And I'm so appreciate everyone sharing this evening. We wish all of you a very happy, healthy, and let's pray peaceful new year. Good, good evening and good night.